good morning so uh, welcome to today's cpc and we before we head on to the relatively long uh, weekend we have an interesting case for you today so uh, this was a patient which was managed and diagnosed by the collaborative and cooperative efforts of multiple departments uh, for st to start i would request dr bhaskar from neurosurgery morning to all so this was a 28 year old uh, male who had uh, presented first to neurology opd with uh, two episodes of generalized tonic clonic seizures in the month of october he had no focal neurological deficits so he was started on anti epileptics and was advised an imaging and to follow up so he did start the anti epileptics then defaulted on it then had a breakthrough seizure and then was restarted and then subsequently after the imaging with anti epileptic medication with seizures controlled he was uh, referred to our department based on the imaging for further plan so when we had examined he did not have any neurological deficit except that he recently had started having bifrontal headache but there were no other signs of raised icp as such so as a part of the pre operative workup we had also started him on steroids and during the routine course of examination there were some skin lesions which dr anil will touch upon and then the radiology will be uh, discussed by dr sarvesh and then i'll pitch in back again yeah thanks dr bhaskar good morning everyone so a patient with cns involvement and skin involvement so let's concentrate on the skin involvement a uh, patient had two erythematous plaques over back and left arm so initially lesion started as small erythematous papules red papules small lesions which then gradually increased in size to form bigger lesions and the lesions were on the back and the left arm so back lesions appeared first followed by appearance of the arm lesions within next 7 to 10 days So lesions were mainly asymptomatic, with occasional complaints of mild burning and itching sensation over the lesions. So let's see the lesions over the back. So uh, it was around five by four centimeter in size, erythematous, raised, slightly raised from the surface, well circumscribed, well defined, plaque, plaque because it was. Size of more than one centimeter. That's why we call it a plaque. So uh, slightly erythematous to violaceous. It was infiltrated actually when we pul palpated it. So infiltration is due to some inflammatory cells that we see in histopath. But on palpation, we can see that lesion was slightly firm, slightly uh, indurated. So that's why we call it infiltrated plaques. And uh, the same similar kind of lesion was present on the left arm, but the size was slightly less. It was four by four centimeter. So lesion was irregular in shape, and there were some satellite lesions also. We could appreciate the lesions, some pseudopods and some satellite lesions are in the formation. So the arm lesions was slightly different from the back lesions. It was showing some scaling also. So now the after seeing these lesions, we can appreciate that these are the granulomatous plaque. So granulomatous plaques, which has uh, mini minimal surface changes, minimal epidermal changes. The pathology is mainly in dermal tissue, and is slightly elevated. And on palpation, the temperature over the lesions were normal. Lesions were non-tender, infiltrated, and then formed in consistency. So over a period of one to two weeks, the lesions changed slightly. The scaling part increased. The size of the lesion increased and it showed some necrosis also so on seeing a granulomatous plaque with skin and cns involvement the first thing that come to our mind is sarcoidosis which it can do justice it's 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 our first differential sarcoidosis then the other infectious pathology of uh, infectious pathology of granulomatous plaque this can be defungal infections uh, bt hansen hansen disease and lymphoma now we will see uh, step by step why how can we explain the differentials so sarcoid uh, classic morphology of the lesions that is brown granulomatous plaque and it has some neurological symptoms also that is seizures 
but the surface changes were against the sarcoidosis diagnosis. Now comes the BT Hansen. Hansen doesn't involve the CNS definitely. We are lucky that Hansen doesn't know CNS. But if we think that both the lesions were different, CNS was a different pathology, skin was a different pathology, then Hansen can be kept, leprosy can be kept. So erythematous brown, granulomatous plaque, satellite lesions, scaling over the lesions favors Hansen. But sensation were normal, peripheral nerve enlargement were not there, and CNS was involved. That's why we can rule out Hansen also. Then comes the defungal infection. The same morphology favors defungal infections. But uh, atypical site of involvement, it should be on the trauma prone sites, maybe extremities. Non contiguous lesions, no osteoparitoma at the site of the lesions. And uh, for lymphoma, the morphology favors lymphoma, but lymph nodes were not known. And CNS involvement in lymphoma is very, very rare, very, very rare. So uh, finally, we had. Uh, on evolution, the lesion showed some necrosis ulceration also. So keeping in these things uh, in mind, we had sarcoidosis and some infectious granular pathology in our, uh, as our differentials. And here we end the colorful part of the presentation, predominantly colorful. Now we will discuss the predominantly black and white part that will discuss by Dr. Sarbesh. And then will come the absolutely colorful part that will discuss by Dr. Divya. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, coming back to the black and white part, patient was referred for imaging. And what we see here, uh, yeah. So uh, these are the T2 weighted images. So if you see this four, these are the three axial images. This is a coronal image. The lesion is in the left frontal lobe. You can see this is the lesion. This is quite irregular. Where is it located? So it is intraaxial. I mean, it is in the parent, uh, brain parenchyma, the gyri, and the adjacent subcortical white matter is involved. So this, whatever black irregular part we are seeing, is the lesion that we are talking about. And this bright part that we see finger-like is the vasogenic edema. So the lesion is inciting moderate to severe vasogenic edema. Some degree of mass effect is evident. We see the first image. This is the optic nerve. This is a distended optic nerve sheath. So it's an indirect marker. The patient is having raised ICT also. As we go beyond, uh, we can see that these are the that kind of, if, if you see that there is some internal nodularity also, internal irregularity also. So this is a very uh, irregular marginated T2 hypo intense lesion with diffuse pedilation edema. This is a T1 image. It's, it, the lesion is predominantly hypo intense. And these are the diffusion images, which shows restriction. So whenever we say see diffusion uh, restriction, it means there is some degree of uh, cellularity slash uh, some degree of uh, cytotoxic edema also going on slash some degree of infiltration, tightly packed inflammatory cell, which is causing diffusion restriction. So whatever. So there, the, the lesion is showing diffusion restriction and there are tiny specks of bleed. Now, bleed helps us because certain lesions, they bleed uh, very frequently. Certain lesions, they never bleed. Like tuberculosis, we generally keep in the last whenever we see hemorrhage. So this is kind of helping us. Maybe tuberculosis is down the differential diagnosis, not the upfront one. These are the post-contrast enhancement. What This is a homogeneous uh, kind of enhancement, a moderate uh, en enhancement. The margins are quite irregular. So means even the vasogenic edema is showing some degree of enhancement. And some internal areas of non-enhancing areas were there. So some degree of maybe uh, necrosis is happening to be start with, but predominantly it's homogeneous. So we have do have some colorful images at times. So these are the ASL images, arterial spin labeling. It shows perfusion. Now, uh, this is a tumorous kind of lesion because it's a mass forming lesion. But if you see, this is how a normal brain parenchyma shows the perfusion and the lesion is non perfused. It's a uh, the lesion per se does not have an intrinsic vascularity. So this kind of help us to rule out a of a high grade neoplasm uh, kind of a lesion. So a non-vascular kind of a uh, lesion. So if you put all the thing together, T2 hypo intensity, something granulomatous happening, non, uh, uh, non, not showing any uh, increased perfusion, so maybe a non-tumorous. So we came to a differential of a chronic granulomatous etiology. In infective, tubercular and fungal are the most common culprits and inflammatory for sure because it is, uh, it is showing the T2 hypo intensity, which is seen in sarcoidosis or IgG4 related disease. Lymphoma, if all lymphoma, it, it has to be a primary CNS lymphoma, but neither the site is typical for a primary CNS uh, uh, lymphoma nor the kind of 
presentation. Okay, I like I invite uh, Dr. Bhaskar again. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's where we were when uh, we were left with a dilemma as to what actually are we dealing with. So like Dr. Sarvesh had pointed out, if and Dr. Anil had alluded to, if you disconnect the two dermatological and the CNS diseases, we did think of something exclusive to the CNS like a meningioma because it was a cortical lesion. There was some dural enhancement, but that doesn't mean that it's always a meningioma. It can also happen in inflammatory uh, conditions. So, but there was no perfusion. It was not high. So that was also unlikely. So one, to establish a diagnosis and second, to do some degree of decompression and then subsequently help in the overall management. So we did go ahead and do a left frontal craniotomy where, okay. So we did find few thrombosed vessels. The brain was definitely edematous. It was bulging <clears throat> beyond the dural opening. And the lesion as such was not very vascular. It was firm, yellowish, whitish in appearance and consistency. And it was a rather uneventful surgery where we could, we were able to excise and the intraoperative frozen report also did not su suggest anything ominous. So, and it was an uneven post-op period. And after a couple of days, he was discharged with no added deficits with the relief of the headache and on anti-epileptics and tapering dose of steroids with the plan that once we get to know the final histopathology, we will then subsequently plan the further course of treatment. So uh, after a week or 10 days, when Dr. Divya had communicated to us regarding the biopsy report, is when we realized that the disease has gone out of the neurosurgery syllabus and it's way beyond our uh, capabilities. So we did call upon him telephonically because he had not reported for follow-up even for the suture removal. So then with the diagnosis being known and the patient not reporting, so we did have a doubts regarding what has happened. So after two, three phone calls also, he did say that he will drop in, but he was fine. So he also did not bother to immediately drop in. Then finally, when he landed up almost a month later, he came back with left-sided hemiparesis, drowsiness, decreased food intake for the five days before arriving. When he did come to the emergency, he did show signs of raised ICP in terms of bradycardia, hypertension. He was having dysphagia. He had significant right-sided hemiparesis. So by this time, we did know what the diagnosis was. We started treatment according to that, along with cerebral decongestants to reduce the int raised intracranial pressure. That did improve his sensorium, improve his speech output, and improve his right hemiparesis to a certain extent. And this was the image that was done when he had reported for the follow-up. So now we can see that there are multiple lesions, left cerebellum, the brainstem, and the previous operated site, and also the left thalamus. And there were multiple lesions elsewhere also. So the disease had spread and all of them did show that there were hemorrhagic lesions within. So like Dr. Sarvesh had pointed out, this definitely points to a certain pathology and which says that it's unlikely to be a certain of them. And the post contrast can show that now even the previous operative site, there were enhancing lesions. There was one here, 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 and there were multiple lesions, both sides, supratentorial, posterior fossa, both. So we knew, and he also had spinal lesions. So the lesion had spread along the CSF pathways to both spine, brain, and this was the scan which was done when he had presented. This was the CT, and then subsequently we had done the MR. So after a couple of days of Improving with medical management, unfortunately, he dipped. 
and then as a life saving measure and probably to buy him some time while the medical measures work and maybe give him some benefit so that he might survive and then subsequently improve by because by the time we knew the diagnosis he underwent a left decompressive hemicraniectomy on 4th this was maybe 4 or 5 days after the admission and subsequent to that he is being medically managed which dr deepak will uh, highlight and the current status that he has reached now is that he is as of now survived he is still decerebrating and we are trying to see whether he can be weaned off the ventilator and the entire plan as of now is that we hopefully we have been able to buy him some time with the decompressive surgery that the medical treatment actually makes him recover and then so fingers crossed we still don't know where that's going to lead him to thank you and this is the sorry and this is the post op scan after the decompressive craniectomy so why this was done recently 3 days back is we just want to rule out whether there is any element of hydrocephalus or any more infarct that he has developed which can explain his not so improvement in the clinical status over the last 2 weeks or so thank you sir uh, so i was welcomed into the new year with this frozen section on my table and this was the was the frozen section from this patient intraoperatively sent and when we whenever we receive a frozen section from neurosurgery we like to prepare a few squash smears from the tissue received we also prepare a few imprints from the tissue and the rest of the tissue is then subjected to cryostat sectioning for examination so these are what we see in the squash smears we saw just these large necrotic fragments and what you see surviving here in the form of these deep blue lines are actually the capillary channels which somehow tend to survive within these uh, infarcted areas again another image to show you that it was predominantly necrotic fragments with a few inflammatory cells which were scattered here and there a lot of cellular debris within the necrotic frag fragments was seen but we did not identify any fungal profiles or any bacteria per se within these fragments there were a few histiocytes scattered we even uh, found an occasional multinucleated histiocytic giant cell an occasional histiocyte and in the section apart from the necrotic fragments we saw these uh, dense infiltrate of chronic inflammatory cells most of which were histiocytes so you see these pale cells with a lot of cytoplasm which are your histiocytes we saw a few plasma cells with the typical eccentric nucleus and uh, and the rest of the cytoplasm and a few lymphocytes with that on and uh, we searched for an organism on the frozen section we did not find anything we did not find any tumor in all the tissue that was uh, sent to us for frozen section so we reported the possibility that it is a chronic granulomatous disorder but we could not pinpoint the etiology then came the paraffin embedded sections and again we saw large areas of necrosis with as you can see the vessels still surviving and a lot of cellular debris scattered within it but what was sitting adjacent to these large areas of necrosis were these dense bands of chronic inflammation which told us that the pathology had had some time to evolve so whenever you see an acute process there will be large areas of necrosis but there will be abruptly transition by the adjacent native parenchyma which will be viable here there was no viable parenchyma whatsoever and all that we saw was that this necrosis had dense bands of chronic inflammation surrounding it so after the necrosis comes the macrophages and then come the plasma cells and uh, lymphocytes here we saw these necrotic areas surrounded by these uh, a few macrophages and within these dense infiltrates as i showed you there were a lot of plasma cells a few histiocytes and lymphocytes there were adjacent thrombosed blood vessels so uh, it is common to find thrombosed blood vessels within large areas of necrosis it does not indicate that these thrombosed blood vessels are the culprit they can just be innocent bystanders in any necrotic tissue you will see the adjacent blood vessels getting entrapped and getting thrombosed there were perivascular lymphocytic and plasma cell cuffing and with this picture we thought of an infective etiology so we did the routine battery of special stains which is your zeal nielsen stain to look for an acid fast bacillus your uh, ps stain to look for any fungal profiles and a gram stain to look for any bacteria gram positive or gram negative none of which helped us the zn stain was negative there was no afv there were no uh, bacteria whatsoever and there were no fungal profiles which we could have appreciated on hne also and neither did pas uh, show us any fungal profiles 
So we went back to our ethnic sections, and what caught the eye of my residents was the presence of these large eosinophilic structures, which were roaming around here and there within the tissue. As we started identifying them, we could see more and more of them. They were large. They were eosinophilic. They had kind of a granular cytoplasm. Most of them were uninucleate. Some of them were actually cut in planes where we could not appreciate the nucleus, and there seemed to be kind of a halo around them. As you can see in these images, it can be very challenging to differentiate these structures from the histiocytes, which are very common in these necrotic tissues. But we did find clusters of them surrounding the blood vessels. They had the, a single nucleus in most of the cuts with some engulfed material within them. And we went back to the PA stain, but the problem with PA stain is it will stain all the stu structures. It will stain the basement membrane of the capillaries. It will stain all your histiocytes. And it will also stain any of these structures that were present. So we suspected with this morphology that we could be dealing with amoebic trophozoites. And uh, since PA stain, as I said, stains everything, even a multinucleated histiocytic giant cell would be PAS positive, we did something that we call as a DPA stain. So in this, the tissue is first subjected to diastase digestion. Diastase is an enzyme which will dissolve all the glycogen. It will uh, make the histiocytes negative for the PAS stain, which is done subsequently after diastase digestion. And then you will look for the uh, section to look for any DPAS positive structures. So you see this histiocyte, it has become negative on the DPAS stain. You can see it here. And there were still these structures which were shining bright, confirming the possibility that if we are dealing with an amoebic uh, etiology. These could be seen everywhere, as I showed you previously. And they were positive for the DPAS stain. So we thought that we are dealing with a granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Then came the infectious disease residents asking as to what exactly is the uh, cause or what exactly is the species of this amoeba. So uh, just to tell you briefly, uh, the free living amoeba which can infect the brain tissue are Nigleria fowleri, Acanthamoeba, Balamuthia mandrillaris, and a very rare one, Sapenia. The three that we can see are uh, Nigleria fowleri, which is the tiniest one, the trophozoites measure around 15 to 20 microns in diameter, and they are actually the ones which are the most closely resembling to histiocytes. Histiocytes measure up to 20 microns in the tissue, and they can be a challenge and a nightmare to diagnose. Again, Nigleria often presents with a very acute fulminant presentation, and it usually has a very uh, diffuse, acute inflammatory uh, pathology, and you usually don't see so many of uh, lymphoid bands or plasma cell bands sitting on the adjacent portions. The other two differentials were acanthamoeba and balamuthia. So acanthamoeba shows you these uh, dense hist uh, plasma uh, histiocytic infiltrates with multiple giant cells. You can see the trophozoite forms and the cyst forms. The cyst forms have an irregular endocyst, which can look like these pleomorphic uh, helmet-shaped or polygonal structures. And balamuthia uh, mandrillaris usually shows these large trophozoites. They may have some engulfed material within them, and most of them are uninucleate. But this was definitely beyond our uh, expertise, and we needed help from microbiology. So Dr. Vibhor, the infectious disease residents, and we all sat down to confirm what exactly was the etiology. Uh, so we, uh, when we saw the size of the organism, the size of the organism seemed to be high. So you can compare it to this lymphocyte. This lymphocyte measures around 6 to 7 microns in the tissue. This organism is definitely around uh, eight to nine times of the size of the lymphocyte, making us think that we are dealing with something which is around 50 to 60 microns, the size of which matched the uh, morphology of Balamuthia mandrillaris, which is what we provisionally thought of uh, when the team sat down for a uh, differential. Just to mention briefly, a few authors do have, uh, they have mentioned IHC for the same. So IHCs are available in the world for Nigleria and Balamuthia. Uh, coming to the two skin biopsies that was that were done, the first skin biopsy, which was done uh, almost close to the brain biopsy, and there was another biopsy which was done subsequently after the lesions had evolved into these necrotic hemorrhagic lesions. So this is the first skin biopsy. You can see that there are uh, there's a predominantly dermal process which is happening, as Sir had explained. There are these multiple nodules of chronic inflammatory cells which are also infiltrating into the dermis, and the epidermis is just sitting there, not really bothered by whatever is going on. There were these nodules of these large, uh, these chronic inflammatory cells. They were predominantly perivascular, and a few of them were actually present in a perineural location. They were composed of the same cells. You had your histiocytes, you had a few plasma cells. They were infiltrating the subcutis, and at places there was plasma cell with infiltrate. So whenever we see plasma cells in skin, it bothers us. You can see plasma cells sitting in the mucosa for no random reason, but in the skin, 
it should instigate you to look for any infectious pathology like leishmania uh, and other infectious organisms. By this time, we knew that the brain uh, tissue was showing us uh, balamut, uh, amoebic trophozoites. So we just went ahead and did a DPA stain. And we did indeed see some DPA positive structures in the skin biopsy also, but they were slightly different looking. These are much tinier than what we had seen in the brain. This is a lymphocyte for comparison. You can see that these are much tinier. All of them seem to have a central nucleus and they don't really resemble what we had seen in the brain, yet they were DPAS positive. We then went to see the cytoplasm, which was densely granular. And that made us think that could it be mast cells? And yes, on a tolvidine blue stain, these structures turned out to be mast cells. So in the first biopsy, despite our best efforts, we could not uh, demonstrate the organism. Then came the second biopsy. Again, you see an unbothered epidermis, dense infiltrate in the upper and middermis, and some paler area in the deeper portion. The upper portion again showed us perineural and perivascular uh, chronic inflammatory cells, but it was in the paler areas where we found a lot of histiocytes along with the organism sitting here. So this time around, you can match the morphology with what you saw in the brain tissue, and the DPA stain highlighted these organisms with a similar morphology in the skin tissue. Hence, confirming that this patient had a cutaneous and neurological infection of the amoebic trophozoites, likely Valamuthia. Just to give you a brief overview, there are four case reports of Valamuthia from India, two of which have been diagnosed post-mortem and two of them have been diagnosed anti-mortem. One of these was from PGI diagnosed anti-mortem and one, uh, another one from PGI which was diagnosed post-mortem. This was another case diagnosed at PGI and which originated from Max Super Speciality Hospital. And another case from Ames Delhi, which was actually uh, uh, diagnosed post-mortem by CDC in the US. Most of these cases are diagnosed at autopsy or on a local brain biopsy. And uh, species characterization is important, but it is definitely beyond our expertise for which we need the help of microbiology. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, so uh, uh, I was uh, given a call by Dr. Deepak that uh, we are having a trophozoite in a CNS biopsy section, sir. Uh, uh, we would like to discuss it with you. So I went and uh, we discussed it with Dr. Divya and the ID residents. And uh, uh, by that time, uh, based on the size of the trophozoite. We knew that this was some chronic uh, granulomatous infection and granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. We knew that is caused by acanth amoeba and balamuthia. Uh, as the treatments of both the conditions are not very well known, but still the treatment modalities, what have been tried are different in their nature. So we wanted to really know what kind of uh, amoeba is it. So. Uh, uh, based upon the size, we had a discussion with Dr. Divya and the ID residents, and we thought that uh, the size of acanthamoeba trophozoites, it ranges from 25 to 40 microns. While the trophozoites of Balamuthia, they range from 15 to 60 microns. So we were pretty sure that what we are seeing are big uh, trophozoites, more than 50 micrometers majority. So uh, we were of the opinion that this is Balamuthia. But still, to confirm our diagnosis, uh, we required the help of molecular methods. And as of now, we were not having any molecular methods to do in our own lab. So we sought help. And uh, the molecular detection of free living amoeba, it can be done by the conventional method, by the real-time PCR method, uh, which can be either single, single uh, primers for each of the amoeba, or it, they can be multiplexed. CDC is having a real-time PCR to detect the three free-living amoeba, Niglaria, Acanthamoeba, and Balamuthia. And most commonly, the target which is used is the 18S ribosomal RNA target. And so we sought help, and uh, we uh, by, uh, called up PJ Chandigarh, and uh, uh, they told, yes, we are doing this PCR. Uh, you can send the uh, CNS uh, brain biopsy sample plus the cutaneous biopsy. Though we didn't see uh, it in the first biopsy, cutaneous biopsy, the, there was no evidence of trophozoites. But uh, they requested that you kindly send. Sometimes you do get it in the PCR. So the, this is the group. This is the latest publication from the PGI Chandigarh team uh, to whom we uh, sent the specimens. And uh, 
we are doing this whole panel uh, of uh, molecular tests for nigleria as well as acanthamoeba as well as uh, balamuthia and the test which they did for us was uh, this 18s uh, ribosomal dna gene of balamuthia and this is a nested pcr and what i would like to highlight here is that uh, once the second cycle of the pcr is complete we get a amplicon size of 201 base pair so if we see compare it with this dna ladder of 100 base pairs so this is 100 base pair this is 200 base pair so this is uh, around 201 base pair length amplicon and this is uh, typical of balamuthia mandrillalis and this is what they published earlier this is the time when they had standardized this test and this is the picture he sent us dr abhishek mewala sir he sent us uh, for our pcrs so here also if we can see this is the 100 base pair uh, mark and this is the 200 base pair and we can see that we are getting our bands at around 201 base pair so our diagnosis which we had thought was confirmed and uh, for this uh, help, we would like to acknowledge the help of Dr. Abhishek Mewada, who is Associate Professor, and Dr. Sumita Khurana, who is a professor, and the whole Department of Medical Parasitology at PGH Chandigarh for helping us uh, confirm the case as Balamuthia mandrillalis. So now I'll invite Dr. Deepak. Uh, good morning, all. So <clears throat> we got the call that uh, from the neurosurgery case, some tropozoites are reported in the biopsy and uh, we have done the multidisciplinary approach and able to get the diagnosis of uh, this uh, balamuthia uh, granulomatous amoebic encephalitis so uh, the cdc has uh, highest reported highest number of cases and the cdc has the very good literature available and only the cdc has the literature regarding the balamuthia granulomatous encephalitis uh, there are uh, three uh, uh, important causes of uh, granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Among them, balamuthia is one of them. We'll discuss other later. So the first case of balamuthia uh, mandrillaris uh, granulomatous amoebic encephalitis was reported in 1986. And after that, total 200 cases is reported among, among worldwide. And all cases are reported uh, by the CDC. And highest number of cases are reported from the USA. It is 109. And because the USA, uh, one Indian origin microbiologist, microbiologist uh, Dr. Govind, has uh, uh, done a very good uh, study on uh, California encephalitis project. And he established a art of state laboratory in the CDC for the diagnosis of Valomuthi encephalitis. And uh, by this uh, series, we can able to get a very good insight of the disease uh, in uh, 1974 to 2016 us has reported 109 cases and among them only nine cases has survived means the mortality of uh, balamuthia granulomatous encephalitis is very very high and most of the cases has reported after the this california encephalitis project it means uh, there's a lack of the uh, uh, detection method is basically a uh, lack of the insight of the disease. And uh, they had found that uh, there's a uh, pleum, uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis can be there in the CSF finding of granulomatous amoebic encephalitis with a slight change in the protein and the glucose, but there's no specific CSF finding for the diagnosis. And most of the diagnosis either that made with the histopathology or PCR. Regarding the mode of the transmission, as we have discussed, there's a two important mode of the transmission. One is the skin and second is the nasal mucosa. In the other uh, uh, free living amoebic encephalitis, nasal mucosa is important mode of the transmission. But in the Bellamuthia, the skin is the very important mode of the transmission. And skin lesion is uh, very, very common with this Bellamuthia encephalitis. And basically, this Bellamuthia is uh, a single cell free living amoeba, which is present in the environment and the soil. And uh, some uh, community surveillance regarding the immun uh, immunological survey found that around 2.5 to 3.5% of the immun immunology become positive in the uh, general population. So regarding the uh, transmission that it is transmitted from the soil, but uh, the four cases of post renal transplant has been also reported as the Balamuthia 
uh, and the letter uh, on investigation they found that uh, they got the uh, infection from the donor and donor had some disseminated uh, form of the cyst present in the kidney as well as the muscle and the liver and the brain so, so most of the patient or most of the person might have asymptomatic uh, uh, presence of the cyst can be there regarding the cl clinical feature as the uh, suggested by the transmission there are two important clinical feature one is the skin and second is the cns involvement and there is no specific clinical feature and in the cns a fever may or may not be present with headache vomiting lethargy nausea and most of the features are sub acute to the chronic type of presentation regarding the treatment and which is the most difficult part of the granulomatous amoebic encephalitis and this list has been given by the uh, cdc and these are the some drug which is found to be in vitro sensitive with this uh, balamuthia uh, maybe these are they contain all antibiotic antifungal as well as some anti leishmanial drug sulfadiazine flucytosine fluconazol azithromycin or chlorpyrifosin Miltefosin, antilismanian drug, and pentamidine, which we use in the treatment of PCP. They are found to be in vitro sensitive. But uh, actually, to uh, achieve the uh, in, vit in vivo dose of uh, these drugs to treat the balamuthi is very, very difficult. And this makes the thing more worsen. So we have started uh, uh, our patient on the treatment of sulfadiazine, flucytosine, fluconazole, and clarithromycin. Among the survived cases, we have uh, reviewed the literature. Okay, what are the regimes which is found to be most uh, successful? Among the survived cases, fluconazole, clarithromycin, sulfadiazine, and flucytosine was found to be very much effective in the two cases, which is again reported by the Dr. Govind only. And uh, one or two cases has been survived with the adding of miltifosin, but CDC, latestly CDC has said that miltifosin is not found to be very much effective. But uh, flu cytosine is more effective than the metaphosine. So these are the cases which is reported by the CDC and which have survived. And most of patients have received fluconazole, sulfadiazine, flu cytosine. And some cases also receive amputation, but amputation is not going to be act on balamuthia, but it is going to be act on niglaria as well as uh, acanthamoeba. So these are the cases which have survived. These are only nine cases. And this one new case report uh, which published in 2000. Uh, 23 only and they have tried one new drug is nitroloxine it is a quinolone antibiotic and they have tried uh, the patient and patient is still surviving and they are still following the patient and this drug is actually not available in the india so among india as uh, dr divya said we have reported four cases and all uh, all four cases uh, succumb to the illness uh, no one has survived so regarding the other uh, free living in amoebic infection, uh, as uh, said by Dr. Divya, niglaria and acanthamoeba are the important differentials. And the uh, niglaria is mainly transmitted through the nasal mucosa only, while in acanthamoeba it can be transmitted from the nasal mucosa but had some transmission with the skin also. So, uh, niglaria is generally have acute uh, presentation, the, the median duration of presentation is five days, and the mortality is very, very high with the niglaria. And amputation is going to be act. And most of the cases of niglaria we can able to diagnose with a CSF PCR. But acanthamoeba and balamuthia both has subacute to chronic type of presentation and very difficult to differentiate. And the mortality is acanthamoeba is relatively lower as compared to the balamuthia. So differentiation of the species is very important because amputation is going to be very much effective for the treatment of acanthamoeba, but it is not going to be uh, effect on the balamuthia. And uh, so PCR is always required and we got the exact diagnosis of uh, Balamuthia granulomatous encephalitis. So, uh, I request uh, sir to again discuss about dermatology aspect. So let's finish what we started. <coughs> so this thing all has been covered. So uh, rarely they rarely cause disease in the immunocompetent uh, patients. That's Everything has been discussed. Uh, the lesions appear again. Let's discuss the lesions uh, in Balamuthia. The lesions appears uh, face, typically face and lower extremities. Our patient skipped these areas: papule plaque, nodule, non-healing ulcer, cellulitis, eschars, and glomerulus plaques. Some satellite lesions also favor the diagnosis. 
So early detection of skin lesions may facilitate early diagnosis treatment, but there are two conflicting reports. In US, only 6% patients had skin lesion. In Peruvian series, around 90% cases had skin lesion. So we can't say skin lesion were there or not. Maybe they were not observed, maybe they were neglected. This may be the case. So classically, what they describe is uh, asymptomatic granulomatous plaque over the central face with neurological signs and symptoms should raise a suspicion for Bellamuthia. So something like this should raise a suspicion if she had CNS in all, but this is lymphoma, cutaneous lymphoma. Something like this can raise a suspicion for Bellamuthia, but with CNS in all, but this is sarcoidosis. If the lesions has granulomatous plaque with some ulceration and with some satellite lesion, so this is Balamothia. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.